Good morning, Year 3 4, and welcome to today's whole class reading. Today, we're going to read Chapter 6 of our book, Oliver and the Sea Wigs. Today, I'd like us to pay particular attention to um, full stops, capital letters, commas, any sort of punctuation. There's obviously exclamation marks as well, so any form of uh, punctuation we know we if it's an exclamation mark we need to exclaim if there's a question mark we'll obviously need to change the tone in our voice so we're asking a question if there's a full stop or a comma we need to take a breath um, if it's an ellipsis maybe we need to pause for uh, to be dramatic if it's in speech maybe we'll uh, use a voice for that character okay chapter six as the Thirlstone vanished, all Cliff's newfound hopefulness drained away. The fight went out of him. Iris and Olla felt him slump. They couldn't blame him, poor old giant. So much of his golden sand and drifts of floatsome had been washed away when he stopped to fetch the water mull. Now it was gone. His stony head was even more bare than before. Now what shall we do? asked Iris. Go after that Thirlstone, of course, shouted Oliver. Quick, Cliff, follow him. Cliff lifted his cave mouth out of the waves to say, What's the point? He's beaten me. Then he subsided again. You can't just let him win, said Oliver. Is he the sort of island who deserves to win the Knight of the Sea Wigs? And as for that Stacy de Lacey, go after them and get that water mole back. How? rumbled Cliff. They have an army of monkeys. He's got a point, said Iris. Then go to the Hallow Challows, insisted Oliver. Tell everyone what Stacy and his Thirlstone did. They won't listen to me, said Cliff warily. They'll be too busy admiring the Thirlstone's marvellous sea wig and laughing at me. So what are you going to do? Iris asked. Cliff sighed. I'm going to settle, he decided. No, yelled Oliver. I should have done it years ago, Cliff went on. What's the point of all this tramping around, collecting stuff? I'm going to stand here and grow roots and forget I was ever a rambler. I'll become just an island. That's all I'm good for. I'm useless, finished, washed up. He sank back slowly into the sea. No, shouted Oliver again. He did a dance of frustration, shin deep in the wavelets which washed Cliff's shores. But no amount of stamping or shouting would make Cliff come up again. Oliver remembered the sad, lifeless, settled isles which Iris had shown him on the way to the sarcastic sea. He imagined the sand and silt slowly piling up around Cliff's feet. Oh dear, said Iris, with salt tears dripping off her chin. I think he means it. Now look what you've done, sniffed Mr Culpepper, fuss fussily rearranging his nest, which had been terribly knocked about by those swarming sea monkeys. If you hadn't dragged us here in search of that stupid wreck, this would have never happened. It's all your fault. Well, I'm not going to let Stacy de Lacey win, said Oliver. Years of exploring had taught him that you don't solve problems by sitting around complaining about them. You have to do something. That's how his mum and dad had saved him from the Komodo dragon. That's how they'd escaped from the dungeons of Mumbi Mumbi. He struck an Irish, he struck an explorerish pose on the shore and said, I'm going to go after that Thirlstone and show it that it can't just go around snitching other people's shipwrecks and kidnapping mums and dads. That's all very well and good, said Iris, but army of sea monkeys, remember? Oh, and your boat's gone all flop. Oliver ignored the reminder about the sea monkeys. He hadn't yet thought of any way that he could deal with them. He had an answer to, to the part about the boat, though. He opened his explorer pack and triumphantly pulled out a foot pump and a punctured dinghy repair kit. One hour of patching and pumping later, he was ready. He shoved the dinghy into the waves and hoisted himself aboard. He tugged the motor's cord. It didn't work. It never did. He needed big, muscly arms like Dad's to make it smart start. Iris looked on doubtfully. I suppose I could help, she said. Oh yes, you'll be a lot of use, snapped Oliver, so sarcastically that even the seaweed was shocked. Your arms are even feebler than mine. Oh, I don't mean like that, sniffed the mermaid. 
she unhooked the motor from the stern of the dinghy and dropped it on the shore. Then before Oliver could ask how that was supposed to help, she scrambled half aboard the dinghy with her tail hanging off behind. Shove off, she said. Oh, isn't she rude, whispered the weed admiring, admiringly. I mean, shove the dinghy off. Oliver shoved. As the dinghy drifted into deeper water, Ira started to flap her tail up and down, driving them away from the shore. It was difficult to steer at first, but they soon worked it out. Iris took the dinghy on a farewell circuit of the island. Oliver leapt over the side through the waves at the great dim cliff face of Cliff's face looming there. He couldn't see if Cliff's eyes were open or closed. He couldn't tell if the rambling eye was watching his friends leave or just too sad to care. He waved anyway. Mr Culpepper flapped over to perch on the dinghy's prow. I might as well come with you, he said. After all, you'll need help finding the thieving island, I suppose. So the albatross took off again, soaring towards the horizon, and the mermaid-powered dinghy followed him, splashing along the lane of open water which the thirlstone had left through the sarcastic seaweed. It was a tiring work for poor Iris. Every few minutes she had to stop and rest while Oliver refuelled her by feeding her caramel bars from his lunchbox. But at last the sarcastic sea was left behind. I wonder why Stacy de Lacey is so keen to help Thurlstone win the contest anyway, wondered Oliver. But Iris was too busy being an outboard motor to reply. Mystical Pepper flew above them, calling down directions. At first there was no need. But Oliver and Iris could see the Thirlstone far ahead, but as the day wore on, the thieving isle drew away from them and a strange haze arose. Soon it was hard for even the sharp-eyed albatross to see very far. We are coming near to the hallowed shallows, said Iris. They began to pass over rambling isles. First they looked like normal islands, but they were all moving, and all in the same direction, with white wakes of foam stretching behind them. Some were as small and tatty as cliff, some were magnificent. There was one who had sculpted a sort of volcano on his upper parts and lit a fire in it so trails of smoke rings mingled with the haze. There was one who had drizzled wet sand onto her head to build up teetering pinnacles and spires and another who had arranged miles and miles of weed into a massive beehive with a small ship stuck in the middle of it. None of them paid the slightest attention to the dinghy. If only Cliff was here, said Oliver feeling sad that he had left their own rambling isle behind. The rest would only laugh at him, said Iris. Some of those sea wigs are to die for. And as you can see, here is a picture of all our sea wigs. Meanwhile, meanwhile, back in the sarcastic sea, Cliff was thinking sadly of his friends. He had never had actual people living on him before, and he missed them now that they were gone. Not only that, the seaweed had drifted closer now that he was not moving, and it kept jeering and sniggering at him, and saying how brave it thought he was. No, he told himself. It's no use worrying. I've had enough. All these years wandering and gathering things, just so another isle can pinch them. That's it. I'm settling here. Maybe one day someone will put another danger submerged rock sign on me. And he shut his eyes and sank his toes down deep into the seafloor silt and tried to stand as still and lifeless as any other rock on the ocean. But he could not stop his mind from working. He could not stop himself thinking. He thought how wrong it was the Thirlstone was allowed to roam around wrecking other people's great wigs. Then he thought sadly about the Walter Mole was the best thing he had ever, ever found. Then he thought that actually Oliver and Iris were the best things he had found. He began to worry about them. He began to think that maybe the jeering weed was right to hint that he'd been cowardly. Maybe Oliver had been right. Maybe he should go to the shallow shall hallowed shallows and tell the other isles what the rotten-hearted Thirlstone was up to. Somebody's got to do something, he said aloud. And Oliver and Iris are too small and Mr. P Mr. Culpepper is just an albatross. So that somebody must be... Uh, me. Woo, said all the seaweed, tittering in that annoying way it had. But it soon stopped, for Cliff was on the move again, striding and swimming as quickly as he could towards the same horizon that Oliver's dinghy had vanished over. 
That's the end of chapter six. So well done for reading along with me today. I hope you are stopping at all the different punctuation and I hope you're using a different voice and expression for our characters. I'll see you tomorrow when we're going to read chapter seven.